This is 9-11 Freefall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 911 Free Fall. I am your host, as always, Andrew Steele. The guest tonight is Richard Browning. He's an engineer and uh, he's a member of AE 911 Truth's presenter team. He's going to be getting out there uh, talking to some important crowds of professionals about the AE 911 Truth controlled demolition evidence, showing uh, screenings of 911 explosive evidence experts speak out and spreading the word, just like so many great activists are doing out there. Uh, as we continue on in our mission to get the reality <clears throat> about what happened to the three buildings in New York on 9-11, buildings 1, 2, and 7 of the World Trade Center, the reality of what happened to them, the fact that they were indeed brought down with pre-placed explosives. Now, if you've never heard about this evidence, uh, you can go into the archives at 911freefall.com and listen to the various experts that I've had on this program, each contributing to this mountain of evidence, justifying a new investigation. That's all AE 911 Truth is asking for. So stay tuned for that interview. That'll be playing in about 10 minutes or so. I wanted to take this opportunity this week uh, to go over some news. There seems to be a lot of it surrounding this 28 pages issue, 28 pages redacted that uh, allegedly point to involvement of the Saudi royal family in the 9-11 attacks, according to the people in our Congress who have read it. So they're trying to get it declassified, trying to get it out in front of the eyes of the American public, the people who deserve to know every single detail about that day. And I find this kind of uh, personally satisfying because I was having a discussion with somebody about the need for outreach to our congressional members. Some people think that there's uh, no hope in doing that, get a little bit cynical about our people in the uh, legislative branch of our government. Uh, and when we were discussing this, he, this person just used uh, an example of Rand Paul, said, you know, what can Rand Paul do? What can Rand Paul do about this issue? And then the next day, Rand Paul did something. He did something about the 28 pages issue. Uh, this article is from Truth in Media, Dot com. It says, Rand Paul unveils families of 9-11 victims and survivors transparency act. And I'm just going to read the beginning of it. It says, today, uh, U.S. Senator Rand Paul, uh, U.S. Representative Walter Jones, uh, Stephen F. Lynch, and Thomas Massey, and former U.S. Senator Bob Graham stood today with family members of victims of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks to announce new bipartisan legislation uh, known as the Transparency for the Families of 9-11 Victims and Survivors Act of 2015. The legislation, co-sponsored by Senators Ron Wyden and Kristen Gillibrand, would require President Obama to declassify and make available to the public the redacted 28 pages from the joint inquiry into intelligence community activities before and after the terrorist attacks of September 2001 which have been obscured from the public for more than 13 years. Also participating in the press conference was Terry Strada, National Chair of the 9-11 Families and Survivors United for Justice Against Terrorism, and her daughter, uh, Caitlin Strada, and Abraham Scott, husband of a victim of the 9-11 attacks. And uh, just to read the beginning of what Rand Paul uh, said... He said, I stand with my colleagues today to call for the release of the final 28 pages of the 9-11 Congressional Inquiry. I firmly believe the family members of the victims of the September 11th terrorist attacks have the right to know the details surrounding the tragedies that occurred on that sad day. The American people deserve a government that instills trust and a restoration of their sense of security. And I believe that the transparency for the families of the 9-11 Victims and Survivors Act is a step in the right direction. I think so, too. Now, we don't cover this issue a lot on this show. We've had guests on, Les Jameson has been on the program to talk about his great efforts uh, with trying to get those uh, 28 pages released. But this is a step in the right direction. 
Now, we don't want to lose focus of our main issue, which, of course, is Building 7 and the Twin Towers as well. But Building 7 especially is so glaring, sticks out so much like a sore thumb throbbing on the hand of the official story, letting you know that there's more to 9-11, just right from when you watch it fall down, letting you know that you are being lied to because, of course, fire does not bring down a 47-story steel frame high-rise in seven seconds. So what this is signifying is that there is a new inspiration within some people to look into some of the ugly truths surrounding that day. Now, does this unearth the entire thing? Of course not. Does this uh, relate to the Building 7 and Twin Tower controlled demolition issue? Well, it does uh, in a sort of distant way, uh, not close enough for my liking. Uh, Of course, I think that this act, and this is why I'm bringing this up here, should be expanded to include the information that's being withheld uh, regarding the destruction of these buildings. Should be expanded to include the input data for the Building 7 computer models that NIST uses to justify its phony explanation for what happened to that building that day. All right, Should be used to prompt NIST to do its own tests on the dust samples, uh, searching for the nanothermite that Niels Herrett and his team found. All right, there's so much uh, within just the title of this act. Uh, It's kind of a mouthful, but the Transparency for the Families of the 9-11 Victims and Survivors Act that can apply to the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence. But this is a step in the right direction. And uh, again, maybe if we keep on pushing, if we keep on building off the momentum of this 28 pages issue, that can be expanded to include uh, what we talk about every week here on this show. And people are passionate about it. There's videos of We Are Change confronting Chris Christie. And I want to put this call out to the audience. Right now is presidential election season. Seize the opportunity, because this is going to be the time when you have the most access to your candidates. Right now, during the primary season, when they're out there at some diner, shaking hands with fishermen and uh, local shop owners, All right, when you can get a video camera on them and go up and ask them about Building 7. Copy some of the questions that were used in the C-SPAN campaign. And you know what I should get... Uh, that posted. I should get questions posted for the audience. So in case you want to use them and there's a benefit in doing that because sometimes, you know, when you're in the moment and you uh, start talking to somebody, you've been planning this uh, sort of confrontation or, uh, uh, you know, capturing them on video, capturing a response, uh, people tend to freeze up. Sometimes you get nervous. So if you have a pre-written out question in front of you, it helps ease the tension uh, within you. And you can deliver it right, and you can also make sure it's accurate. So i got to find a way to get those up. Uh, keep watching 911freefall.com, and I will find a way for that to be available to you. But uh, just do whatever you can. Take advantage of your access to the people who want to be the so-called leaders of the so-called free world. All right, Don't let them get away. Put the pressure on them. Uh, turn the screws. Uh, This is your country you are fighting for. And using politics only works when you put political pressure on people. I'm convinced that's the only reason that we haven't been able to get our Congress to do something. We haven't generated the proper political pressure. Because nobody does anything they would rather not do unless they are afraid. And no, I'm not talking about violence or any kind of threats. I'm talking about fear of embarrassment, fear of being voted out, fear of being shown for obstructing a murder investigation. Nobody wants to be the bad guy in the history books, especially these people, because they're all about their image. And you have nothing to lose. All you got to do is tell the truth and be factual, and uh, you can get the message out there. And again, a lot of times these politicians are not even really your target anyway. It's the audience watching, because then when they respond to a question about physics and common sense by calling you a conspiracy theorist, I mean, they may get a few people to giggle along with them, but the people who actually think, the people who actually have some uh, reason between their ears, scratch their heads and say, well, uh, that was actually a very rational question. Why are you calling them a conspiracy theorist? And then the seeds are planted and people look into it later. So do whatever you can. Go to New Hampshire, go to Iowa, get the word out. 
All right, before I play my interview with Richard Browning, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. We're going to do that beginning now. And that is 10 seconds. Richard Browning is a 1959 graduate of the engineering school at Washington University in St. Louis, and he completed the requirements to become a professional engineer in 1967 for the professional engineering license in the state of Missouri. Prior to starting his own company, uh, Richard has worked for McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. He's worked for the Department of the Army up in D.C. during the Vietnam War, where he was involved with the Armor Protection Program for Army helicopters. And he spent time in Vietnam doing product evaluation and training. And uh, he's been with Mobile Oil Corporation, too, as a lubrication engineer. In 1973, he founded Industrial Technologies Incorporated, an environmental... Uh, an industrial equipment business, which he continues to operate to this day. Richard, welcome to 9-11 Freefall. Glad to be here. And I forgot to mention, too, that Richard is on the AE 9-11 Truth Presenters team. He's going to be going out and doing some uh, presentations for AE and uh, showing our film to different places around the country. So I'm very to ha happy to have you uh, with us to be able to draw from your wealth of experience and your passion for this issue. I can feel it whenever I talk to you on the phone. Now, I gave a Reader's Digest version of your bio. Please feel free uh, to include anything else that I may have left out before we get into 9-11. Well, uh, just a little bit of background on, on me. I was born in the middle uh, 1930s uh, during the Depression. Uh, grew up in a middle class, uh, or actually lower middle class family. Uh, my parents actually lost their home during the Depression. Uh, but my dad was able to keep a job as a quality control inspector because he was an engineer also. And my mother was a nurse, uh, and although nurses didn't make much money back in those days, it was sure nice as a kid growing up having a mother as a nurse to heal all the wounds and everything that I had. Uh, my dad was a pretty avid reader, and I learned a lot uh, from him because of that. So I had a pretty good childhood. Well, I like what you say about your mom being a nurse, and that's very helpful when you fall and hurt yourself. My mom wasn't a nurse, but I always chose to go to her instead of my dad, especially if I had a splinter, because then that old pocket knife would come out, and he all of a sudden became a surgeon. And uh, just the sight of that thing just uh, made me run the other direction there. He meant well, but 9-11. <clears throat> Obviously, you have a, a background... In engineering, how did you first wake up to the controlled demolition evidence? What prompted you to want to start taking action about it? Well, I think I was probably like most other people. You figured that what you saw on TV is what really happened. Uh, probably the uh, the biggest thing that woke me up was uh, Richard Gage and Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Uh, that had a big impact on me. Uh, once you see Building 7 come down... Uh, you know something's wrong there. It just uh, buildings don't collapse like that. And um, when you see molten metal coming down the side of a building, uh, that really surprised me because uh, uh, I learned in school uh, what different metals melt at, and uh, and there's no way that kerosene can cause uh, steel to melt because it never gets over. At best, I would say 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's only if you've got uh, forced oxygen to it, which it did not have. And most of the jet fuel was burned outside the Twin Towers. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big impact on me. But I think uh, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth really woke me up. Uh, and then that's really what got me involved so much because it's obvious that uh, we were not told the truth about that. Right, and it continues to be obvious now as we move forward here in the post-9-11 world, uh, continuing to suffer the consequences of 9-11, and it took people some years to uh, even realize that there was an issue here, that there was even a controversy about why these buildings came down. Many people didn't even know a third tower fell 
until they just happened to be on YouTube. Maybe they were searching for something else and they came across a video put out by AE 9-11 Truth. Had you heard people talk about this issue even before you came across uh, AE's information? I would say no. Uh, and even today, I ask a lot of people. In fact, I ask people almost everywhere I go, how many buildings collapsed on, on in New York on 9-11? And virtually the answer, I would say that at least 90% of the answer is two. And this is, what, 15 years after uh, after 9-11. So most people still do not know about Building 7. It's, it's wild. I mean, even after all the work that we've done, and we're certainly trying our best, but as Richard Gage said when he was on C-SPAN, I mean, most architects and engineers don't even know about the third worst structural failure in modern history. And I even hesitate to call it a structural failure. There's debate about whether we should even call it that because it wasn't a failure. It was a controlled demolition. So let's just call it for what it is. All right, fires don't bring down a 47-story steel frame high-rise in seven seconds. And that's a no-brainer there. Have you talked to other engineers about this issue? Oh, uh, Andy, I've probably sent out over over 200 DVDs that I purchased from architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth to uh, engineers, uh, uh, plant managers, uh, uh, government officials, firemen, policemen. Uh, I've done that. I've been doing it for quite a long period of time. I've also, I do own a studio uh, it's a, a fitness studio, but it has an auditorium with a large screen, and I've put showings on. I've run ads in newspapers. I've invited all kinds of people to come and watch some of the DVDs. The response generally, well, the response on on Building 7 is they never knew about it before then. Uh, but even after seeing it, people recognize that, uh, that uh, something else happened. But they go away and don't do anything about it, and which is disappointing. I've had just I've had very few people come back and and say they've talked to other people and they're trying to spread the word, but very few people are doing that. Well, we need more people like you. I think of you like a Tony Stark type, a person who's made a success for himself in business. You have some of the resources, like your gymnasium has that uh, uh, presentation room you were describing a moment ago. You have the ability to send out these mass mailings. You are doing the work that we need more people doing. Um, and so I salute you for that. It's the people behind the scenes doing these quiet things look I, I years ago there used to be a video website called chat roulette and it was this uh this website where you go on there and you can click a button and talk to another person so you, you know you, if you don't like talking to this person you click a button and there's a another person to talk to so what i would do i had a couple of computers i had a, a running loop of building seven coming down and some words written like uh something like uh, can you do believe fire brought this building down? Building 7 was a controlled demolition. And I would just have it run. I would let it run all night. And it was almost like my own personal signal into space. And who knows how many people would see that. But it's this kind of work that most people don't even know about, uh, doesn't get publicized, going on in the background that's going to win it for us. It's this kind of stuff that this machine that keeps this information suppressed, the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence suppressed, uh, that they're afraid of. They don't want this interpersonal communication. They don't want uh, us to be talking with one another and not using the internet, taking it to the streets. So I commend you for everything that you're doing, everything that you're going to continue to be doing as you move up here and start making uh, presentations. Uh, what did you consider to be the strongest evidence when you were... I mean, I know you've touched on this a little bit already, so I'm not, we're not going to belabor it, but what did you consider to be the strongest evidence when uh, that really made you say, oh, my God, this is a, a controlled demolition? Well, Building 7 is obvious. There can be no doubt in anybody's mind that, as far as I'm concerned, that Building 7 was imploded. Uh, nothing hit that building. There was minor fires, and it came down in the afternoon. You know, what was it, 5.20 in the afternoon, I think, on 9-11? And the interesting thing is the uh, the gal on uh, BBC uh, announced that it was coming down before it came down even, I think. Uh, didn't it show her uh, making the announcement that Building 7 was still standing in the background? <laughs> uh, 
I found that amazing. Yeah, and they talk about it so matter-of-factly, the other side, and say, okay, they were a little early, so what? Well, it shouldn't have been reported early because it shouldn't have happened to begin with. I mean, this was an unprecedented event. So not only did you have something unexpected and completely unrealistic happen, uh, again, a 47-story steel frame high-rise collapsing in seven seconds because of fire, allegedly because of a, a single failure in a or a failure in a single column right but that they predicted it early this unprecedented event well going back to the the twin towers uh, and all the firemen that lost their lives there there's no way had they known that those buildings were going to implode like they did that they would go on up in those buildings and up in the twin towers uh that's the first time that's ever happened the only time in all of history that a steel frame building has collapsed uh, due to fires or an airplane hitting it or anything else that's not been intentionally imploded. Right, and the buildings were built to withstand the impact. I've, I've quote, cited this many times. There's an article uh, from a British newspaper written right on the day of 9-11 pointing out that there was an information panel uh, in the buildings, in the twin, one of the Twin Towers, saying, don't worry if an airplane hits this building, it can withstand it. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what the message was on it. So what happened here? Why do we all of a sudden turn our brains off collectively as a nation when government comes out with an official story. Now, I can understand maybe in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, but here we are over a decade after the event took place and we need to be asking the real questions, asking the questions that over 2,300 architects and engineers who have signed the petition have asked and continue to demand uh, for a new investigation into that uh, tax. And we, uh, so... I mean, I commend, again, commend people like you who are willing to speak out. Um, let's go into some current events here. Uh, I mean, the AIA has taken a position by denying the AIA or the AE 911 Truth uh, position vote. Uh, we're asking them to simply call for a new investigation into Building 7, acknowledging the controversy. I mean, what, what does this say for your people in your profession right now? Uh, that the AIA has endorsed a position saying that uh, random fires and thermal expansion can bring high-rises crashing to the ground. What does this do for people who make buildings? I don't think it does much for them. It's, it's amazing to me that uh, that resolution was not almost unanimously passed uh, at the architects' meeting uh, last month. Uh, that should have been. Uh, I, and I, from what I understand, the... Uh, the chairman or whoever his position is of the AIA uh, spoke against it uh, with the understanding that it's going to cost the AIA too much money to investigate that. Uh, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong, and the guy should really resign from his position, I think. But, you know, going back to, and I deal mostly with engineers and not architects, but uh, I've, I've given DVDs away to... Uh, uh, professors at universities, particularly Washington University and a couple of others, but I, I know the people at Washington University, and even the dean of the engineering school, and he poo-poos it. He just, you know, that's, you know, that's um, I find it hard to believe, but uh, it's not really important to him. I think it should be important to everybody. The effects of 9-11, I believe we lost about 3,000 people there. If I'm not mistaken, we lost... More we lost more there than we did on D Day uh, deaths on D Day on the attack on in Normandy. Well, I don't know. I don't know how many people we lost on Normandy, but that's a good point, though. I mean, I think it was about twenty six hundred that were killed. Okay, and here and then, great, uh, great bringing that up because we just had D Day, the anniversary of D Day, take place. So very relevant. Um, but there you go, and it's, it's you wonder what's going on with people because even if they can say you have a point, they act like you're debating about the properties of some moss growing on a log in Central Park, not talking about the greatest mass murder in our nation's history, the biggest attack on our soil, uh, I mean, I think ever. So what? Uh, I mean, what is going on there? I know you can't probably explain it. I can't explain it. We've been trying to figure this out for over a decade. Uh, there will be volumes written about the psychology of the United States at this time. Uh, you know, in the future after this already gets acknowledged. Um, but I mean, just from your own experience and your own understanding of the human race, what do you think is going on there? I think uh, most people in this country are 
it's it's not important to them. Look at the voting record in this country. Uh, in most cases, the number of people that come out and vote are what twenty, thirty percent or less. Even in the national elections, there it's not very much greater than that. Uh, going back to uh, other events, look at the assassination of uh, Kennedy. That's been over what over fifty years ago, and and people still think that a lone gunman shot him, and that to me that was a big cover up by the government. Also, we need to be we need to be active. Uh, you know, this country, uh, people in this country need to be active, but we just allow politicians to to do their own thing. Well, and it, all it takes is small things done well every single day. Now, you've taken it upon yourself to find uh, important people in our society, again, uh, business owners, foremans on construction sites, police officers, these types of people, and you've taken it upon yourself to send DVDs to them. And you know, Richard Gage, when he was on this program a few weeks ago, described it as, uh, like filling a swimming pool. You know, you don't feel like you're making a lot of progress initially, but after a while you go back and check on it, you're like, wow, I, I filled up the swimming pool a quarter of the way. Now it's half of the way. Now it's full. Now it's running over uh, and, and flooding the lawn, right? So that's the kind of stuff that we need to keep on doing. We need to keep on filling the swimming pool because as we do this, the other side scrambles to try to bail it out and uh, maintain their official story, but that's got to be very stressful for them, and I don't think they can keep it up for long. I mean, imagine being the other side. All we have to do is tell the truth, but they have to protect a lie. That cannot be a very comfortable position for them. That's a good point. I, I agree with that entirely. It's a good point, and, and they do. They have to continue to lie about it. Obviously, you're not an education analyst. You're just an American like myself, but... Just uh, from what you see, you know, about our public's education in school or out of it, uh, does it need to be enhanced in order to make us less susceptible to these kinds of deceptions in the future? Oh, my gosh, Andy. Our educational system has collapsed in this country. Uh, I go back to uh, my degree in 1959 and the education that I got in in grade school and grammar school, which I thought was pretty darn good. It was, it was uh, public schools. It wasn't private schools. But uh, the educational system for my kids was, I think, much worse than mine. And I think for their kids, it's even worse so, uh, even after that. And uh, I think it's deteriorated greatly since uh, President Carter established the Department of Education and the federal government has taken over the education in this country. Uh, the testing that goes on, they, te they, they teach for testing and uh, they don't teach the facts. Uh, teachers are are really prohibited from uh, even talking, I think, about 9-11. We ought to have teachers talking about this. If we had that going on, uh, we would uh, get kids that maybe weren't even living back in, uh, in September 11th, of 2001, that would say, oh, my goodness, what went on there? But we don't have that today. Well, you know what's funny? I remember growing up uh, being really interested in history in school. Uh, I would always those were my, always my big topics: astronomy and history. That's when I really paid attention. The rest of it, I kind of uh, went to sleep during or drew little pictures during. Um, but I, I really wanted to hear about this stuff. And what I always noticed about history every year, they would always they would always have a different focus on it. This year we're doing U.S. history. Next year we're doing world history. But when the in the times in, in school when we learned U.S. history, uh, by the end, they were always rushing to get through the, the latter part of the 20th century. The stuff that most affects us now that happened, they would be kind of rushing through it. Like, ah, uh, okay, we went to Vietnam and a lot of people died and then uh, Reagan, Star Wars, the end. All right, now you're going to have a test. And, you know, they would spend all this time on Eli Whitney and the Cotton Gin and um, the Salem Witch Trials and and this stuff that, uh, you know, is important. You need to learn about it, but it's been pretty much resolved by now. And also, too, um, the lack of emphasis on science. Now, if I was president, I, I would not interfere with the education, but... I would try to encourage from my position uh, an increase in science education, make it seem really cool, come up with some cool goals like uh, going to Mars or something like that to get kids really excited. I mean, how much do you think the lack of overall education in America uh, in the sciences has contributed to the 9-11 problem that we now face? Oh, I think it, it's a, a big event because uh, 
Uh, and I've talked to a few kids, and I, in fact, I gave a DVD to the superintendent of the school district here where I live and, uh, and invited uh, myself in to give a presentation to uh, high school kids. I didn't necessarily think we should go after the uh, grade school kids because they may be a little too young to accept something like that, but high school kids should, uh, and he totally turned me down. Uh, and I don't know that... Uh, I don't know that I see uh, very many of them going into uh, the sciences. Uh, I know at Washington University, uh, I would say that probably at least half of the kids that are into the uh, engineering school are, are foreign students coming from China and Japan and other places around the world. Doesn't speak well. Well, you know what gets me is... I, you grow up and you get this ideal put in you, this understanding of the world, this understanding of science, making you think, or at least making me think, I can only speak for myself, uh, thinking that science is pure, science is fact-based. Uh, if science shows something, then that's how it is, and people will test the theory and understand it, and, and it will become accepted as fact if the theory is proven to be true. But then you grow up. Then you deal with an issue like 9-11, the controlled demolitions of the towers in Building 7, and uh, you get to understand how much politics is played into science. I mean, for instance, in my area, uh, my con congressman is banking a lot on the fact that he has helped get a, a drone manufacturing base or a manufacturing company here in this district, which is economically depressed and needs jobs desperately. So people are happy about that. All right. A lot of the drone work and contracts are based off of the wars that were started after 9-11 as a response to 9-11 that continue on. All right. And a lot of the surveillance and, and all of that, the, uh, the new post-9-11 world uh, surveillance state that we now enjoy. So do you think that he is going to be interested in hearing that 9-11, a large part of it, is based on a lie, that it was a controlled demolition, that we need to reinvestigate it and, and uh, consider the implications of that? Of course not. The people who are working at the drone plant that they're building, do you think that they're going to want to hear that? Now they're moving into nanotechnology. And so all of this seems to be just based off of what's going to make people money, not at arriving at any kind of truth and any kind of better understanding of our world, whether it be the physical world or this the uh, what happened uh, during events like 9-11? Well, if we take that attitude, and, and you're probably right there, but if we take that attitude, we've had war now since, what, 2003 in this century. We're going to have war throughout the rest of this century. I guess the benefit that I've got is I will not live through the end of the century, but we're going to be in continuous war. And uh, is that what the country wants? Is that what the people want? I, you know, they seem to think so, but... We are got. We have to always be going to war. It just is amazing that we uh, allow people to be killed, and we kill people in other countries, and we come. They come back here injured uh, severely, and they they're disabled for the rest of their lives. I would think that people should stand up and say, "No, enough of this." But they don't do it. Or at the very least, take a pause. I mean, I'm not even asking people to agree that it was a controlled demolition. I'm just saying. Hey, reinvestigate it. You know, that's the most reasonable p position that anybody can take. So even if you are somebody that has staunchly defended the post-9-11 wars, has staunchly defended the surveillance state, who thinks that 9-11 uh, happened because they hate us because of our freedom, it is still the most reasonable thing to ask for a new investigation simply to address the questions that have been raised. Because when the government doesn't address questions, reasonable questions from reasonable professionals, then it leads to conspiracy theories that the other side likes to demonize, which doesn't make a, a good situation here in the United States in terms of our security, our stability, people's faith in government. So the secretiveness of this government, the silence, the stonewalling has led to the uh, beliefs about government involvement and in all of this. So the most reasonable position to take for anybody, no matter what side they're on, is to say, okay, let's run, rerun the analysis with the correct information about Building 7, with all the building features included in it. Let's uh, do the same test that Niels Herrett's team did on the dust and see if we get the same results. But the government won't 
won't do that. They refuse to do that. And of course, this is going to make people, um, uh, you know, begin to suspect certain elements. Uh, that's going to be the natural conclusion until they address these questions. So I don't see how anybody could not want to investigate this. Well, the government does not want to investigate it. If 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 it's investigated and and a lot of the truth comes out, the government's going to be in a pretty bad position, don't you think? Well, I know. I mean, I know that they're going to have a lot of questions to answer, uh, and I know some people get concerned about these uh, this kind of war gaming or uh, scenario creating as we think about what the results would be. I think it would be great for America. I would be just fine myself. My life wouldn't change all that much other than I'd have to find something else to do uh, every week, which I'd be happy to do because we exposed that 9-11 was a controlled demolition. But, yeah, there would be people in government who would have to answer to the people that they serve, which is the American people. America itself would be more strengthened, I think. Oh, I think it definitely would. I think, uh, in fact, I think the other countries are looking at 9-11 more carefully than we are in this own, in our own country. And they're asking questions, even though these some of these uh, foreign people that have uh, criticized the 9-11 Truth Commission, or 9-11 Truth people, uh, they've come down pretty strong. But I don't think they're, uh, they're credible. Uh, I guess popular science is somewhat credible, but uh, uh, that was a total lie. I wonder how much he got paid to do that. Well, the popular mechanics people who, I mean, they've been debunked time and time again. AE 911 Truth has produced a series of articles written by Adam Taylor debunking popular mechanics. Uh, one of the researchers, I can't remember if he's the lead researcher, he was obviously important enough to be interviewed about it, uh, made a fool of himself when he went on the Charles Goyette show, uh, claimed to see pictures of a 10-story uh, gouge in Building 7 that uh, NIST ended up coming out and saying that that wasn't the case, so... Made a real fool of himself in, on that program. Yeah, I mean, anybody can find that on YouTube for themselves. Um, so I, I don't think they even reference Popular Mechanics anymore. Have not even bothered to apologize for the shoddy job that Popular Mechanics did. Just kind of pretend none, none of it ever happened. That 8911 Truth doesn't really exist. Uh, that physics and common sense is a conspiracy theory. And hope that America just merely goes on its way, but it's not working out for the other side very well. Because people are waking up, certain world events are making people look at this with a more uh, careful eye, a more vigilant eye now. So I think that the momentum is in our on our side. What do you think? Well, I think it is too. And in, in fact, uh, just yesterday, uh, I had a call from uh, the chairman of the program chairman for the. Uh, Lions Club in uh, Washington, Missouri, and he wants me to put on one of their at one of their meetings uh, uh, about a 35-minute talk on 9/11, and I immediately agreed to do that. Of course, and I'm excited about that because it very well could be that uh, the police chief and the uh, fire chief and the, maybe even the uh, mayor of Washington, uh, Missouri, will be there, and it's going to give me a good chance to talk to some fairly high-level people. I think. So I'm excited about doing that. Well, I'm excited, too. This is really good news. And again, this is an example of what the other side doesn't want. It doesn't want public presentations. Again, you know, you're speaking to this club in this one part of the country. It's not national television, but it's speaking to that group. And then you keep on doing it. These are interactions and communications that the middleman can't control, that the censors can't control. They can't jump in front of you and call you a conspiracy theorist after you make your presentation uh, to this club there in front of all those important people. Right, So this is why we need to be speaking out in every single way that we can. Even if it's not out on the internet, if it's not out on television, you're still making a difference. And maybe even a bigger difference because now you have that personal connection. You're reaching out to people and looking them in the eye as you do it. And people can speak more openly when it's more private. So I, I commend you for that. Well, I've at my, uh, at my studio here, we've probably put on... Uh Oh, I would say at least a dozen, maybe even 15 presentations. I've run ads in the paper uh, inviting people to come, and we've had anywhere from uh, a half a dozen up to maybe uh, uh, 25 or 30 people show up. And uh, most of them go away shaking their head and wondering why in the world weren't we doing something about it. Some of them have gone away not believing it, 
but uh, you know you're always going to have some of those. Well, yeah, I mean, there's people who you can you can show a, a picture of somebody uh, hitting a button and the building's coming down, a video of it, and they still would not believe you. Um, that's just how it is, though. You don't need everybody to go along. It's you just need. Those people in the middle. I mean, again, there's people who have been talking about this for years on one side. There's people who have been staunchly defending everything that goes on uh, here in the post-9-11 world and following it off the cliff on the other side. And then you got those people in the middle, simply living life, getting married, having kids, uh, building their their story, writing their story of their life uh, with this in the background, who may casually hear about it and form opinions on it, those are the people you need to target, the people who are not as passionately involved. But they're they're the ones who uh, are going to make all the difference in the end. They're the people whose support you're going to need. So that's where you want to be reaching out to, not even not the people who are just going to stick their fingers in their ears and not want to hear it no matter what you say. Those people are few and far between. I think a lot of people are open to this. And even in, in private settings, they'll agree and say it needs to be reinvestigated again. Yeah, in private settings, they may say that. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of the people that I've called on, well, I won't say a lot, but a number of them, uh, just to almost ignore it. But uh, some people even ask me, well, how long are you going to keep doing this? And I tell them, well, I'm only 79 years old, and I'm, as long as I'm living, I will keep uh, promoting the truth about 9-11 because it's the, it's the most significant thing that's happened in this century, if not since the Second World War. And uh, we, we need to address that. The country needs to address the cover-up of 9-11 if we're ever going to get anywhere. Right, because 9-11 is the default event that the other side uses to justify the things that are bothering most of us now, the NSA surveillance, the uh, need to attack this or that country. we got to prevent another 9-11 from happening. Well, now we got new information. Well, it's not even new information. It's old information. Uh, but it's it still hasn't been acknowledged, and we know that they're lying. It becomes... Uh, very apparent when they just attack the messenger instead of the message. I, I'm curious, though, how much do you think the demonization of the term 9-11 truth is played into the public's perception of us? I think it's uh, significant. When, in some cases, when I tell people that I'm promoting the truth for 9-11, they, they roll their eyes. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it's one of the, they take one of those people that are conspiracy theorists, uh, but that's uh, that conspiracy theorist is a misnomer. Also, the the conspiracy is the cover up of nine eleven, not the people that want to promote the truth about nine eleven. Well, right, and I almost feel sometimes that I am in a novel written by Aldous Huxley or George Orwell. Uh, Maybe it doesn't exist in this universe. Maybe it exists in a parallel universe where we're all characters in a book, but. Uh, you read Brave New World and you hear everyone saying, oh, praise our Ford. And it sounds like a joke. It's like a, a, a satirical reflection of that society and you don't think people would ever be like that. So in this hypothetical novel that we're living in right now, the word truth is a slur. The word truth is a way to attack somebody. You truther, you terrible, terrible person because you're looking for the truth about this horrible mass murder event. And so the uh, the society is being satirized, is being portrayed as this way, and somebody who's reading this book can't believe that a, a world like this would ever exist. They think it's an exaggeration. But unfortunately, folks, this is real life for us here. This is the truth of what we're facing. This is what our society is like. And I don't think that the general public, John Q. public out there, is like that, is thinking of truth as a slur, but the machine has managed to take that word and turn it into something negative. So what does that say about the people who do that, that they demonize that word truth? Well, it doesn't say much for them, but, uh, you know, the Patriot Act is a prime example of slowly taking away some of our liberties. And people uh, are nonchalant about that. They say, well, it's not going to bother me. I need to be protected. But uh, it's slowly taking away this and that and everything uh, on a slow basis where you don't hardly recognize it. But one of these days we're going to wake up and we're going to have George Orwell's, what is it, 1984, whatever his book was. 
Yeah, I mean, and people, you know, people will argue about whether what we're facing is 1984 or Brave New World. I mean, does it need to be either? Does it need to, do we need to get to that point before we put the brakes on it? I hear so many people get excited about the thought of, a, of a, uh, some kind of dystopian world being created here um, and, and just warn about it and almost talk about it like it's an inevitability. And it doesn't need to be. I mean, we can settle this civilly. We can settle this by the rule of law, by the following the law of the land, by simply demanding accountability from our congressmen or running for office ourselves if uh, we can't uh, get that. And creating that needed resistance against the status quo, creating that friction that causes the machine to grind and and uh, ruin its gears and eventually fall apart because uh, you know we've stood in the way of it, we've uh, put a, a wrench in their processes. So you know you're doing that with all the actions you take each day, and there's so many people out there we probably don't even know about who are doing that too. Oh, I'm sure there's hundreds more like me that are doing even more than I'm doing, and there's a lot more doing. Richard Gage is a prime example of, of he's given his career to doing this, and I, I really commend him for, for the effort that he's put forth. But you know, as far as running for office, we've gotten to the point where, you, if you don't have enough money and enough influence, uh, you're never going to get elected to an office. Well, I'll tell you what, I had a guy on uh, about a year ago, we're coming up on the anniversary of it, because I remember he was the 4th of July episode, and he was running a campaign off of an iPhone uh, with a, it was a Google Plus page was his campaign webpage. Now, he won his primary for the Democrats, I believe it was. He did not win the general election. Uh, eventually, but he did win his primary, and that's still a step. And this is what I say: you know, even if you don't think you're going to win, if you can be cool with with losing, if your whole identity is not built around becoming the congressman from whatever district you're in, if you don't have dreams of being the president of the United States someday and everybody knowing your name, and you just want to tell the truth and watch a bunch of ambitious uh, people willing to toe the company line sweat. Uh, you can still make a big impact. Just getting into the debates and talking about this out in public, because the more you talk about it out in public, the more it becomes acceptable. The taboo is erased from it. Uh, more people feel comfortable to talk about it themselves. What do you think about that? Yeah, Andy, I've never thought about that. I've often thought about running for office, uh, but figured I didn't have enough money uh, to win. I don't. Re- you're right, I really don't need to win. All I need to do is is get my message out, get the truth out. That's a good thought. There you go. May have to re- I may have to reconsider running for office. <laughs> there you go. Congressman Browning's career starts here, right here on 9-11 Freefall. I was the spark here. So, but no. But seriously, I mean, that's what, they don't, that's what they're so afraid of. I mean, I, I, I've gotten to the point where I'm not really worried about interrupting uh, polite society. I mean, I, I'll pick my moments. I won't do it in every single circumstance, but if... Uh, if it comes up, I have no problem talking about it openly. And if some people exchange uncomfortable looks or want to change the subject, and I keep on talking about it, it's not really my problem. It's not real. Their discomfort is not my issue. So uh, there was a candidate who ran here in New York, uh, one of the counties, uh, on the Green Party ticket, who was openly uh, supportive of our position, and he talked, I don't know if 9-11 ever came up in the debates, but he talked about some other issues that uh, sort of related to it, and you could see that they really wanted to avoid talking about it, but he was also the most real guy in the debates, and the other people you could tell had rehearsed their speeches, they were uh, getting talking points from their parties, but he came off as the most comfortable and secure, and uh, you know he didn't win, but... You know, who knows what goes on in the counting? I'm not going to speculate on that. But he still got his message out. And he still played an important part in that election and in that whole dialogue that surrounded the election. And, you know, when you talk about a particular issue, it forces the other candidates to address it, too. You know, that's a good point. I'm, I'm going to have to give some thought to that because uh, that would give me an opening to talk about 9-11 much more than I than I had given thought to before. Well, there you go. So what do you think? <laughs> um, I, I'm happy I, I, because I, and I want everybody to have this thought. I want everybody listening to me right now to think about your potential. And people always get scared. They always think that, that they're not good enough, that they're not going to 
uh, do well. But I think most people are, are more afraid. You know, they, they tell themselves that's what they're afraid of, but I think they're actually afraid of their own potential. They're afraid of their own ability to succeed because they can't imagine themselves being successful. I think the movement needs to do that. I mean, if you're going to lose weight, one of the first things you have to do is imagine yourself as do, as having done that, as being a thin person. If you're going to quit drinking, you got to imagine yourself as not needing alcohol to get through a day. Right, So what we need to do is imagine success. Things I've been successful with, I've actually imagined the outcome the day after it and uh, and, and went, used that as a starting point to sort of branch out and, and make it happen. Things become more clearly. So let's imagine the day after 9-11 truth. Let's imagine what America is like when we no longer have this monkey on our back, when we can move forward and be the country we always proclaim to be, when we're not worrying about this anymore and not everything is a big crisis every single second. We can go back to, to caring about the stuff that we cared about before 9-11. I think that day can come. It will come. We just need to put forth a little effort right now. Put forth effort like you're doing uh, right now and even considering running for office. There's lots of people out there, and who cares if you win? Your ambition uh, is not to be the president someday. It's to get the truth of 9-11 exposed, and that'll be a great story in our history books. I've said it so many times before. Do you think it's possible that we could expose it through the political system, though? Oh, boy, through the political system. I'll tell you, I, I've gotten to the point, where, and maybe this is very callous, but to the point where I look at our political system is pretty corrupt, and and they've got to protect themselves. They're protecting their jobs and their futures, and, and um, boy, I don't know. They're going to fight. Uh, they're going to fight the truth as long as they can. Uh, but that would be interesting. You've given me a thought here. I... There's no way in the uh, in the uh, district that I'm in that I can run on either the Republican or Democratic ticket, but I could always run as an independent. I'll have to look into. <laughs> I'm, you're giving me a lot to think about here, Andy. I'm I'm going to have to find out how many votes I have to get uh, or people to petition in order to get me on the ballot, but that very well could happen. We're having a, a brainstorming session right here on the air, and it's not just between me and Richard here. It's between me and the audience because. I don't know what all the steps are for running for office. I'm I'm in the middle of uh, uh of some things right now. I can't do it, but I can maybe in the future. And so you know, find out what it is. Uh, maybe you have the ability to do it. Maybe somebody out there listening right now is retired, or you are uh, simply have the resources to do it. You don't even need a lot of resources, really. You could just go campaign after work. But find out how many signatures you need. Go to a local peace group. And tell them your position and see if they'll go out and help volunteer for you. Get your brother to help you. Get your uh, your kids to go out and get the, the signatures. I mean, if you don't uh, worry about all of the negatives that people throw up in front of you, there will always be people trying to talk you out of doing what you want to do. Um, but you can't listen to that. And if there's no logical reason not to do something, if all you have to fear is not succeeding but there's no real consequences from it, then give it a shot. Give it a shot. Try to live your dreams and say, hey, at least I tried. I got into that election. I talked about 9-11 on that stage. I watched them try to move on to another topic, and you know what? Just like a boxer trying to pull somebody back into the corner to wail on them some more, I kept on wailing on this issue. That's a good point, Andy. I, I'd never looked at it that way, and, and that's really a good point. I'm going to have to give us some serious thought to that. Now, obviously, you're, you continue to do this. People have asked you how long you're going to keep this up. What gives you hope? This is a question I commonly ask people. I want to hear it from you. What keeps you in this fight? What keeps you considering now you know, running for office and, and keeping this in your mind as you move forward and, and hope to expose the truth about this issue? I think more than anything else, the future of the country. If we don't address this, uh, I think that we could have another 9-11 event somewhere down the road that could be even worse. Uh, we need to wake up to the fact that... Uh, we cannot allow something like this that is so obviously uh, corrupt and uh, untruthful to c continue to exist. If it does, it doesn't speak well for us as a country. It doesn't speak well for us as people. It doesn't speak well for us as politicians. We need to address it, and I will continue to do that until they put me in a grave. That's right. I think a lot of us will. So uh, you're doing a great job here on the presenters team. You're getting a lot of stuff done out there, uh, setting up some great 
speaking engagements for yourself, and I wish you luck. We're going to follow your career and hopefully your political career if you decide to run. Uh, but Richard Browning, thank you so much for coming on 9-11 Freefall. Okay, Andy, I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. This program's on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck. Commission, which was tasked with giving us the fullest explanation. No, not one sentence in the 571 pages of the 9-11 Commission report even mentions the destruction of World Trade Center 7. Is this one of the reasons, perhaps, that Senator Max Cleland resigns from the Commission, citing it's a national scandal, the investigation is compromised. How about expert corroboration? How about Danny Jewenko, 27-year controlled demolitions expert? It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work, without a doubt. How about Hugo Bachman, Professor Emeritus, Chairman, Department of Structural Dynamics at Earthquake Engineering, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology? In my opinion, the building, World Trade Center 7, was with great probability professionally demolished. Here's a floor plan of Building 7. Now, to bring a building smoothly, symmetrically, into its own footprint without falling over, what we have to do is remove the core columns, because what we want to do is bring the outside of the building in on itself. Now, this involves a high degree of precision that fire is not capable of being an organic process.